This lecture has been made available to you courtesy of the American Numismatic Society. Now, you know that why people collect differs from person to person and is a subject for a long discussion some other time. But since this hour has to do with my collecting, I want to say just a few words about my own habits in this regard. I've collected coins since I was about eight or nine years old. That's 75 years ago. And I shifted focus from coins to metals about 50 years ago or more when I noticed from the marketplace of that period that you got more for your money with metals than with coins. Things have changed since then. But metals are larger, heftier, more variable, and hence contain more information packed into them. But my underlying motivation for all collecting both coins and metals from the beginning, I'm convinced, was escape from the realm of parental control, from the constraints of my immediate environment, and a departure from the present to the safer location of the historical past, a place where no one could tell me what I had to do, where I could freely explore new pathways and engage in new experiences, however virtual. Like many other collectors, I never started by picking out American coins from circulation. I always favored foreign coins and medals. Thus, coins and medals that were exotic, either iconographically or linguistically, were always of special interest to me. And this escapism seems to have motivated me to collect beyond borders that are defined in standard references and by conventional series. So even though I have for many years specialized in collecting medals related to Jewish and medical history, buying things that were marginal and previously unknown to me has always come naturally. With that introduction, let me share with you some of these items that have come my way over the years, <clears throat> but which have defied full identification, either partly or entirely. Speaking of identification, though, what does that term actually imply? Obviously, every metal can potentially be characterized by country of origin, date, method of production, iconography, textual content, metal size, etc. Some of these characteristics are merely descriptive. Others have to be deduced when they are not specifically indicated upon the medal. Many medals do have a date and a declaration of where they were made, but many do not. Sometimes the function or at least the cultural context of the medal is manifest, but other times it is not. One occasionally even aspires to figure out who designed or produced the medal. And of course, determining rarity or trying to find earlier published information are frequent goals of the collector. Thus, some identifiers of what I'm about to show will be immediately evident, while others may be harder or even impossible for me, at least, to figure out. Mystery is not, need not be all or nothing. The known to unknown ratio in a given metal may be quite variable. So with that introduction, I want to introduce some of these, quotes mysteries I've acquired over the years, projecting their images and sharing my own reasoning about them thus far. As I said, by way of introduction, I hope you'll feel free to comment or add any additional ideas you may have about each metal, what it is, or how I might further produce my pursue my inquiry, either while the image is still before us or else at the end of the talk. And with that, let me start by sharing my screen to put us where we're supposed to go. Well, let's see. So Emma, I again have to undo that. Uh, uh, thing in order to be able to share my screen better. No, that was the wrong one. So it's not escaping. What do I do, Emma, to escape from this when, oh, there it goes, okay. So this is the first object. This is a pseudo ancient metal. It shows a wreathed head of a bearded man and a strange sort of 
Greek letter forms on a 70, a 47 millimeter bronze thing that suggests to me at least antiquity. Obviously the sharpness of the lettering, the perfect roundness of the form, the reverse design of a rooster and chicks, and above all the carefully carved, hand carved edge make clear that it's not from ancient Greece, nor is it at all typical of fake ancient coins from the Renaissance or later, such as these, uh, usual kind of cast imitations of antiquity. The one on the left is a pig of the sort that's used in the Balkans to insert under the doorsteps of houses that are being built in imitation of antique coins, which was supposed to bring good luck. The one on the right is a copy or fantasy of an Etruscan ice grave type of thing. So going back to this, the question is when, where, why, and even how this pseudo antique metal was made. All of these are uncertain. Is it a cast? Was it struck? It's very sharp. Was it engraved by hand? Certainly the edge was engraved by hand. What's the relationship between the obverse, which is a Greek head, let's say, and the reverse, which is looks like a, a bird of some sort, maybe a rooster, um, protecting about seven chickens. What would have been the purpose? What was the intended audience? As I say in the introduction, and I sincerely mean help. I wonder if there's anybody who's willing to pop in and say anything about this particular metal before I move on to other weirdnesses. Does the legend mean anything? Not to me. There may be people who, I, I've shown this to somebody who speaks some Greek, didn't mean anything. And it looks to me like gibberish. It is gibberish. Yeah. I, I'd offer one. I'd offer one other thought. The um, edge looks somewhat similar to what you see on Spanish silver coins, uh, Latin American. Um, not a very good replica, but, but similar. The iconography doesn't remind me of anything with respect to Latin America. You'd tend to think maybe the uh, large bird could, you know, condor. Uh, but it certainly doesn't look like a condor. But the edge, when I first saw the edge, the first thing I thought of were the large Latin American silver crowns. Yeah, the sharpness of the detail and the cut edge leads me to wonder whether the entire metal is uh, a repoussé or carved in some way on a very thin flan, and the two are mounted within this ring, that the ring is a secondary addition. But, Ira, where did you get it? Oh, I bought it from somebody in England a long time ago. Okay. The provenance uh, will help us. It comes from the trade, as do most of the things that I'm about to show. All right, let me move on. If nobody else has uh, it. Yeah. Let me just say that I think it's rather spectacular artistically, even though it's naive. It's fantastic. I'm... I'm with you. It's a fact. <laughs> no doubt about it. The question is who, why, when, where, and how still remain unsolved. A mystery. Oops. Uh. Now, the next one is also sort of pseudo antique. This one is silver, 57 millimeters. And it also in evokes antiquarian theme but it poses some other challenges. We can sort of deduce from the pose, the pose of a balding bearded man with his hand to his chin, that he's meant to represent a thoughtful ancient philosopher, perhaps Socrates, who was described as bald and bearded. But why the 10 stars, which incidentally seem to me, though the pieces in his cast, to have been punched in secondarily? And it has a loop for wearing at the top, which raises the possibility that it might have been some sort of academic prize. Who knows? Again, the origin, the date, the style, and ultimately the purpose are speculative. 
And I'm open to your speculations because I don't know. To me, this looks like it's earlier than the 19th century, but I really don't know when it was made. Any thoughts would be appreciated. Um, can we leap in there, Ira? We were thinking a bit like the last one with this sort of rim, that it means that it's got to be like either sort of early 19th, but probably going back much earlier to sort of 18th, you know. Yeah, I'm uh, with you, Francis. I think it's in the early yeah. 19th or early, yeah. but I don't really know. And prize medals, which I'm assuming, I'm just assuming from its loop that it's a prize medal and the Philistine. Yeah, but do you think that's being repurposed later, say in the 19th or uh, 20th century? Could be, could be. So I, you've got an old thing. Yeah, it's and similar, then by the way. And a, if you notice the edge, the edge also looks like it's made of two parts and may again have been put together from different uh, pieces. Okay. I think the iconography of the hand is something much stronger than him simply stroking his chin. No, and I think he's thinking. He's a thoughtful yeah. person. Yeah. Okay. This is yet another thing that evokes antiquity. It has an entirely different style and complexity, and yet it purports to be ancient. It's struck <laughs> It's from well-cut dies, but this 50 millimeter metal, like the others, is apparently unpublished. And despite its easily interpreted iconography and its extensive and entirely legible text, its purpose, the message it seeks to present, is not entirely clear to me. The obverse circular inscription specifies the date, the seventh year of his glorious reign. And the reverse identifies the sovereign as the god Titus, son of the god Vespasian, who destroyed Jerusalem and saved the Roman victory in the war against the Jews. So far, so good. Though the style of this medal is radically different from ancient, ancient uh, Roman Judea Coptic coins, such as, oops, I'm going back, yeah, the ancient Judea Capta coin, which is well known, and imitations of it in many, many forms from the Renaissance and later on, which always saw a triumphant uh, Roman warrior lording it over a defeated Judea representing the nation or the people. This particular thing, celebrates something else. The motto, Ablato Lumine, uh, seems to, to me at least, to translate as, I put out the lights. And it raises the question of why the maker of this particular medal chose to emphasize the seemingly anti-Jewish, anti-religious reference when the tradition, as we have seen in antiquity and ever after, is to project the Roman viewpoint as the defeat of Judea as a polity or as a nation. We then have to consider who, when, where, would this particularly novel emphasis have made sense? And I ought to add to this the unusual shape of the menorah. Everybody knows what traditional menorahs are like from the Arch of Titus and from menorah coins of antiquity. This is clearly a Renaissance maybe early Baroque type of menorah of what I would call an Italianate form, but it's very atypical, you'll agree. So I don't know where this was made. Could that, um, be, could that be the eternal flame from the temple? And no, Ablato it's a menorah. It has seven branches. The menorah was the form that had seven branches, and the, since this is about the destruction of the temple. Uh, it clearly represents the temple menorah. Well, an ablation is a, a removal or a taking away. So to me, it says, I took away the light. <laughs> Fair enough. I accept the correction. This is a Vespasian son of Vespasian, Titus. Son of Vespasian. Yeah, no, it's, the, it's Titus, the son of 
the uh, god who, after all, completed the conquest of the Temple Mount and took away the temple. I grant you that it's a temple taking it away rather than putting out the lights. I just emphasize that it's very different from the usual Judea capta things that celebrate the same victory. I would point out one last thing. Up here, there's an AE. And over here, there's also what looks like to me an AE. And this may be a copy of some printed linear description in one of these books that imagined what ancient coins look like. But that doesn't tell me where this was made or why it was made in this particular way. And the reason that I bought it was because of this unusual uh, constitution. Okay. This is Jack. Can I just ask a question? Are, are any menorahs in that shape known? Yes, there, there are menorahs that were made by people in the Renaissance that look like that. That's true. And could I, it be, a, could it be a, a misunderstanding of the artist who thought that the lamp in the temple looked like a menorah? Since he had no, absolutely it, no idea it, what that lamp well, would look like. This is a menorah for sure. That's it. And the menorah, as you know, was removed to Rome and is depicted on the Arch of Titus. Oh, so, we do know what it looked like. Oh, well, it doesn't look like this. At okay. All. Okay. Let what me, is that Reddit at the bottom? There are other mysteries to solve. Speaking of menorahs, this is an utterly modern metal. This is 80 by 58 millimeters. It's a cast bronze. And it was manufactured in Germany by the Karl Polath firm. And it was made, I have found out, by a well-known artist who specialized in Christian church architecture and sculpture, Max Fallon, by 2012. In fact, it's the production of an element that Fowler made for the door of a Catholic church near Dachau in Germany, and which was installed in the year 2000. The iconography is striking, and it shows the Christian church superimposed, you might say, the Jewish temple menorah in a more conventional depiction. There are what you might see as laurel or olive on one side, there's wheat and uh, grapes, all symbols of the Holy Land on this. And so the question is what it represents. Historically, Christian triumphalism showed the church suppressing, or at least superseding, the temple. But I think that this represents a more conciliatory thing that's made in Germany and put on the uh, door of a current church that shows not so much supersession as reconciliation between the two by admitting that Christianity is based upon more, than you your medicine today? more ancient Jewish faith. I'm going to move on because this is which which denomination is the Catholic. He's a Catholic. He works with Catholic churches. Well, I, I believe that since Vatican II, the Catholic Church has taken the position that the Jewish covenant remains in full force and effect. Well, sure. I, I believe, as I say, that this is a positive yeah. reconciliatory thing. It might have been in the medieval age a supersession type of thing, but it's not anymore. Yeah. I, I think you're clearly correct about that. Yeah. Just going back to this uh, Etruscan thing, the reason I bought it is because I thought he was wearing a Jewish hat. As you can see from these medieval portrayals of Jews, the Jew, the Jew hat looked very much like this in my ignorance. I, I bought this for that reason many years ago. Here's another mystery. The mystery is on the left. It shows a headless woman dressed in late 18th, early 19th century classicizing dress. And she's beheaded or headless. But it says peace in Israel. Show you for comparison a late 17th century, early 18th century German medal 
with a very similar looking woman whose breasts are exposed, whose hand is extended, who's holding her dress, and yet the other side of this medal shows a, a German gentleman. And the expression, the rest is good, suggests that this is a, a sarcastic medal that shows that the body of a woman is good and her head is worthless. But if you try to transpose that to my object, which is the peace in Israel thing, you got to scratch your head because what the hell does this have to do with peace in Israel? So there are possible explanations. My first thought was that this occurred at the time of the French Revolution and that somehow chopping the head off women and had something to do with bringing peace, but that doesn't go very far. It turns out that St. Paul uh, wrote about in, in 1 Corinthians, said that the head of every woman is her husband. And the implication is that women should not presume to be independent or thoughtful. So could it be a comment on the sexual appeal of women as on the earlier 17th century medal, but I really don't know. And I, and of course, this is a impression from a seal. Seals were made in this form, in pseudo antique form in England. And this clearly comes from an English context at the turn of the 19th century. But what the hell is going on? I don't know. So I'm open to your suggestions. Do you have an image of the obverse or the other side of this piece? Yeah, there is no other side. It's a flat thing. No, I'm talking about so the plaster, side. by the way, in gold leaf paper. This was made at the time, but I don't know. No, I, I mean the, the German object. Yeah, I, I, I didn't show it, but I'm telling you, it shows a gentleman who's talking about himself and commenting that the rest is good for the woman who's over here. I don't show the other side, sorry. Anyway, I'm stuck with St. Paul, but I really am puzzled by this. It's a long uh, thing. It's been long in my collection and I don't really know the answer. Here's something completely different. We're now in the subject of unnamed portraits. This is a very large subsection of unknown metals. And here's an example. This is either bronze or I think it's actually steel melded to a bronze plate, which has a flat back. And I think that it was made as a punch. I don't think it's a metal because it has this irregular form and I think it was made as a punch to be used in the making of medals or badges. And of course, it shows a gentleman who looks 19th century-ish. And as it turns out, I bought it at the same time with another thing, which comes from Baltimore. And Bumi is a Shriner organization. And this is the Shriner motif. And so this too was probably made as a punch to make a badge of some sort or other for some other use. But I show them both because I bought them at the same time and they're both, in my opinion, punches, not medals. And the question is then, how does one deal with a portrait, a very handsome portrait indeed, that's unsigned and unnamed? And I haven't you know, gone too far to try and find him, but he's probably a very real person. And I guess if I went to the National Portrait Gallery uh, and, and sought out things, I might somehow find something. But I give it to you as an example of portraiture that's unknown that I have, to my own satisfaction, identified as coming from Baltimore at the turn of the, 20, uh, the 20th century, maybe a little earlier, but I'm unable to deal with. What's the size? The size is uh, small. It's uh, 
let's see, it's 40 by 30. 40 millimeters, that's a big size for a punch. No, 40, 40 millimeters would fit as if you were making a badge of somebody who was say a general in the Civil War and you were making a badge of him, something like that. Let me go on to another unnamed portrait. This is a carving in wood. It's not a very elegant carving of a guy who looks like he's dressed in 16th century garb and presumably is a nobleman or a warrior or you know a soldier of some sort. It's not what you would call an elegant portrait, but it does look like a carving. The question is, is this a contemporary carving, which I don't see any reason to doubt, although not a very skillful one, or is this something that was made for collectors at a later date to try and fool them into thinking that this was a Renaissance carving? The answer is, I don't know anything about it. It may well be a contemporary portrait, or it may be some sort of later thing, but I don't see why somebody making a later thing, say in the 19th century, would make it at this crude level uh, of somebody from there. So it's one of those, I just don't know. Any thoughts are welcome, but otherwise I'm gonna have to move on. Do you know that it's a carving or could it be? Oh, yeah, no, it's a carving. It's, if you had it in your hand, it has a flat back. It's made of wood. It's a carving. Yeah, but it could be compressed boxwood, which it's is not, very popular. No, no, it's carved. It's carved. You can see, I well, let me go back. You can see over here where there are extra lines that were slippages and so forth. It's okay. Carved. Trust me, Bob. Now, this medal has more information yet. It's a portrait and it says who it is. His name is Felix. And it says who did it. Arthur Rose, uh, Leventhal, who's a known portraitist who worked in Vienna at the time, 1901, which is dated. It's a cast medal, 163 by 123. The guy's name is Felix, and we even know what he did for a living because these are mulberry leaves with silkworms. And this are two silkworms to form the X. So we know a tremendous amount about this guy, but we don't know who he is. Presumably because Leventhal was working in Vienna in 1901. The guy may have even worked in Vienna or this may be a uh, commission. What we don't know is what the name was and on what occasion the plaque was commissioned. So I have bought it for its beauty and because I imagined that he might be Jewish, but I just made that up. I don't really know. So it shows that you can know a lot about a medal, but not know everything that there is to know. Here's another medal with a portrait, and I know exactly who he is. This guy, Lucian Deroni, was the president of the Société Américaine de France. <clears throat> and he died in 1871 while he was the president. So making a medal of him as the president with his birth and date deaths pose no problem at all. But what this bird is doing and what it represents is a puzzle. Is it a rooster of France, a weird one, a joke? Is it a Prussian warrior? Because he died in 1971 during the commune right after the War of 1870-71. I don't know. So the mystery here is not who this guy is, where it was made, what, who sponsored it, or what the hell this bird represents, and for that matter, what this cross represents. Because he was a well-known ethnographer of America, and the society was all about America. And by America, I don't mean the United States, I mean the Americas. And so this bird and what he's holding in his hand are mysteries. Any thoughts before? Yeah. Ira? Yes. Clearly, he's holding a mask. That's, I mean, that's a, the face here is on, 
that's sort of like a carnival mask that somebody's holding in front of him. So the head on here is you going to be that? Just, is in because front. That's the head? This is the mask, and that's what's holding. He's using to hold it in front of him. Question is, what is it a mask of? You know, it almost looks like he's wearing a Scottish beret here, but that's, you know, it could be anything. Well, to me, this looks like a nose, and this looks like an eye. Yeah, and there are the lips. And with eye burns with a mustache. Yeah, I. To me, I. It, I wondered whether it might be Prussian, but I. I have no idea, and what these <laughs> things are, I have no idea what they represent. It looks Central American, uh, to me. I read. Well, it looks like something that you like Maya or sometimes you get those okay. stacked heads. Well, Pat, that would at least make some sense in the context of the Société Américaine de France. You've helped me in that regard. I never dreamed that it might be an American bird, but you're absolutely right. This double tail could be some sort of exotic bird. You're right. From looks, Central America or something like that. It you're could not, be a cat. Yeah, very good, very good. Thank you. There's a French word on the uh, cross that you had yeah, mentioned. A, a preuve, which means test. Yeah. And a, um, that would seem to indicate to me that maybe that represents the uh, cavalry that France had just gone through the war of 1870-71. No, no, no. The word approve has been engraved on this. Right, right, right. But I'm saying this what it represents it could represent the test that France has just gone through in the war of 1870-71. A pull of the meaning test. It's just possible, guess, but so. I don't think so because it would be part of the medal per se rather than engraved secondarily in that case, I think. Let me move on because- I, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't, Medalist whose name is on the, the obverse. Yeah, he's, he's a known medalist and he worked in Central Europe. He's a German. Hey. Yeah, uh, just one Here's something more. entirely different. This is almost certainly an American medal. It's struck in copper, and it has inscription. It has. It it's. It it's handsomely made. It has an eagle. It has a palm. It has laurel. It has oak. And it has wreathing on the reverse. It's obviously made as a prize medal that's not been used. But unless we happen upon one that has been used, which helps us to date it, or we find some way in somebody's brochure of medal makers who made it, it's a total mystery. I wonder if any of you have ever run across this particular medal, which is a very beautiful, you know, but, and typical medal of, I would say, the mid to late 19th century. In other words, does the eagle or this um, serpent, you know, feeding on itself, which are both typical things, remind you of any particular American engraver? Because I'm just assuming that this is American. I don't actually know that it is, but. That's the question that's before us. So and the eagle holding a snake is a symbol of Mexico, but it's not usually an Ouroboro. It's it's being throttled by the by the eagle. Yeah, no, no. I this is a triumphant eagle. I guess there are other countries that use eagles, but you know, it's to me it looks American, but you know, I don't really know. It has clouds in the sky, it's got all these wreaths. Incidentally, I don't even know what this plant is. This is laurel or olive again, but I don't know what this plant is. Anyway, moving on to another American medal that's a mystery to me. <laughs> medal that's struck, it's dated. It has the word on the right, Phila, which I take to mean Philadelphia, but it could be not Philadelphia. There's a dot right under it. So I think it means Philadelphia, but I don't know that. It has these wiggly lines that would be very common in the um, Art Nouveau period, which a little, this is a little early for Art Nouveau, but it's possible. 
And on the other side, it has A-G-L-A. Now, it turns out that if you Google A-G-L-E, you get 14 different things. Australian German Lawyers Association, <laughs> Arizona Girls Lacrosse Association, none of which are much of a fit for 1886. Turns out that A-G-L-A also is a well-known acronym <clears throat> for a Hebrew expression that you are great, O Lord. And that expression as an acronym is used as early as the Middle Ages and certainly in the 17th and 18th century on amulets. But this doesn't look like an amulet. So that's the problem. This is A-G-L-A -A with dots, which suggests that it is an abbreviation four dots, and this has a dot too. But again, there is a well-struck, well-designed, attractive thing that I haven't the foggiest notion of what it is. Any thoughts? Well, Are I think your Art Nouveau is, regardless of the date, is quite correct. And I would think that would keep it out of the US. Well, then we have to deal with filler if it's not from the US. You, you see a lot of, of, of uh, athletic badges and athletic association awards in the, in the uh, US, Philadelphia, New Jersey, New York that, that have some of that kind of funky Art Nouveau lettering really? on them. Yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm betting on Philadelphia. Without Philadelphia, I'm totally lost. So I'm betting on Philadelphia and I think of this as American, but we'll have to move on again because time is passing. Now here is a, here's a medal with an obvious acronym. And the acronym is HKC or HCK, whatever it is. The style I would guess is at least 18th century, maybe even a little earlier. This is a probably not real coat of arms and it's, fancy and looking at all of the stuff, let's say 18th century, but is there any chance it's struck? It's struck in white metal, by the way. Um, it's 48 millimeters. Are we ever gonna find out what HKC or HCK means? Well, uh, I would think that is HCIF. There's no yeah. K that I'm seeing. Okay, HCIF. I, I take your correction. I think you're right. HCIF, okay? That gives me something new to Google. Thank you. That's really helpful. But it's not signed. An F not there? Placed. To me, it looks German or Central European just because of all of this ornate stuff. But again, it's a mystery that I haven't been able to solve. I think it's a fictitious coat of arms uh, with a dragon with some sort of a tail. But again, maybe it's a real person. Ira, could that be uh, uh, C-H-I-F, Chemin de Fer of something or another? I don't know what the I would be. Like yeah, I think it's too early. I think it's too early to be a Chemin de Fer because I think it's before the 19th century. I got you. Chemin de Fer in the 18th century. Okay. Um, okay. Ira, um, could it possibly be a secretary bird on the shield? What kind of bird? A secretary bird. It could be, and maybe that's a clue as to where it comes from. I'll there, there's a, there, there is a um, um, a guild of of the guild of um, stationers has a secretary bird as a as a in its motive that's in london yeah but this well, is london so it may be a guild from another place that's to do with station okay a secretary bird i take yeah. of that and i thank you francis here's another textual issue these are two jetons small jetons one with uh louis napoleon i think which is hygiene and propriété paris one with Marianne, République Française, both of them say Exposition Universelle, 
Système Américain, 1867. So again, they're highly identifiable, but the message is unclear. I bought them years ago because I thought they might be medical and fit in my medical collection, but I've never found anything medical about a Système Américain. Recently, I found out that Henry Clay, in 1850 and 1830 even, proposed a Système Américain economically for the United States. The Système Américain meant a strong central government with a national bank to foster commerce, tariffs to protect the growth of American industry, subsidies to provoke to promote infrastructure. That would be a program that you'd recognize in 2021. And it was a very protectionist program. And if that's what's being referenced, you have to ask the question, what the hell is it doing at an Exposition Universelle, which is the opposite, which promotes international trade and has nothing to do with tariff walls and local subsidies. So, that's the mystery to me. If this is a system American and I found out nothing else other than this Henry Clay proposition, which is well known and lasted for decades in the Congress of the United States, but what it's doing here on two tokens is a mystery to me. It's also curious that they used the Republican image on a metal presumably issued in France, or a token issued in France in 1867, when of course there was no republic, it was the Second Empire. Yes, I think, Jay, that such things as you see, Louis Napoleon would also not have been appropriate at that moment in time. So this is a series of tokens that made in some factory somewhere where they had the dyes lying around. And why they made them, and why they mule them in this way, is, as you say, a great mystery to add to the other mysteries. Okay. Are you sure that's Louis Napoleon? No, of course, no Napoleon, I'm not sure. Yeah, because the beard is somewhat different. Yeah. And I'm wondering if it didn't have anything to do with proposals because of the um, the hygiene sort of thing that there might have been, there were hygiene systems that were being proposed around the world at the time. Well, there, like I said, the system American doesn't- And related to the hygiene, uh, no, no, that was why I bought it in the first place. I bought them together. I bought it because I imagined that was the connection. I have failed as a historian of medicine for decades having these to ever identify a system American in the medical literature. Believe me, I've tried. But I don't think it, it may not be there. It might be more in the social literature. There are, there are some things there. Um, I'll have to, I'll look around and I'll send it to you if I find it. Thank you. Yeah, I'm guessing it's not Louis Napoleon, but I, I agree with Scott that the beard is much too full for Louis Napoleon. And also, frankly, I, I, I withdraw the Louis Napoleon. It could be Respay, it could be a lot of people. I agree. If they're talking about the American the, the, system, why would it not be an American hygienist? Yeah, but the reverse is what interests me, Bob. The interest is in the system American which is mule to two entirely different outbursts. Let me move on. This is a familiar form. It's a medal of Jesus with Hebrew, and I collect these by type. And the Hebrew inscription, yes, well. explain it, says Jesus in Hebrew here, and Adonai, or God, here, okay? And on the back, it says the Messiah, the King who came in peace and the light of the world who was resurrected. That's what it means, okay? And it's made and copied for centuries, centuries upon centuries. Copyists make a lot of mistakes. Here's a copyist who didn't understand Hebrew and who thought that the name of Jesus was a fist and who thought that the letter the letter Aleph was a lock of hair and who didn't understand what the hell was going on on the back and who put a lot of gibberish on the back. That this is a bad copy 
we can all agree. That's not the point of my mystery. Point of my mystery is this. Now, something that was made in Europe to be worn would have a hole or a loop. This is clearly made to tie onto something. And therefore, I hypothesized that this was made in a missionizing context in Europe, not in Europe, but in Latin America, in Africa, in Asia. And if any of you can tell me what this looks like and where a hanging piece would look like this, I would appreciate it. I would also point out that on the edge, there is an extensive Latin inscription in scholarly Latin, which includes the word Jesus and Gloria and so forth and so on, that's engraved in the edge. So some missionary made this somewhere other than in Europe. And the mystery to me is where the hell it was made. Any thoughts about this hanging device? How about India? Yeah, I, I'll buy it. I'll buy any place <coughs> with Catholic missionaries in yeah. the period F. This starts from the 16th century on. This could have been made in the 16th, 17th century, maybe even the 18th century. Looks like it could have been suspended from a ribbon, like a medallion, a medal, to be worn, you know, to be worn ceremonially. Well, I think it was made amuletically, but I think that this would have been had a, a cord tied to it and hung around the neck or something like that. There was no loop at the top. What? There's no loop at the top. No, no, there's no loops. Trust me, this is a thing. I showed you both sides of it. There's no loop, no hole. Anyway, that's the mystery. I, uh, there. And if we, I, if we could just we'll, go back for a minute. I have a feeling that that uh, uh, System American is a dentist medal and it's Horace Wells and it's anesthesia. Okay, I'm willing to accept that as a hypothesis, but I don't know. But actually, I found out on Google that it has to do with hygiene medical. I put it on the chat. Yeah, the, the, the obverse is not the issue. The reverse is the issue. I appreciate we've agreed that the obverse dyes and reverse dyes are not necessarily related. The question is what the words system American mean in this context of the exposition. That's the it question. May, it seems to refer to the hygiene. Look at the chart. OK, I will. <laughs> I want to move on because there are other questions that I want your help. One of the things that happens in mysteries is that you find a mystery and you have the, and all of these are unpublished mysteries, you understand that. You think that you've found something that you can identify definitively and even make something valuable. This is a medal that's signed with a P. You can see it where my arrow is. That P, is the definitive signature of Pastorino de Pastorini, a well-known Renaissance, late Renaissance uh, engraver who worked in Ferrara in the 16th century. We know all of that. And this is his typical signature. Not only that, but this portrait bust is typical of Pastorino's work. He made 150 or more medals, and many of them look just like this. They're all published, but this one is unknown. Published ones almost invariably have a name, but this one doesn't have a name. Now, it turns out that this medal is mule. It's an aftercast that was once hold, and it doesn't pretend to be an original. It's an aftercast, but it's been muled with the reverse that comes from that Jesus medal that I showed you earlier. The exact same text, not as beautiful, but the copyist made errors. So the question is what this Pastorino medal 
unknown to us otherwise, even though his medals are well known, is doing with this particular back. Now, let me tell you my wishful thinking hypothesis. Turns out that Pastorino worked in Ferrara in an age when the Dukes of Ferrara were extremely uh, favorable to Jewish people. And during that time, Pastorino made this medal, which has now been lost and is only known from a picture. And it says Abramo Nursia, it's abbreviated. This is a person who is well known to have lived in Ferrara and it's a Pastorino medal. And it bears a considerable, not perfect similarity to this guy. Not the same, the beards are different, you don't have to tell me. And it turns out that many Pastorino medals look sort of like this. But my wishful thinking hypothesis is that this was a portrait of this guy, which was rejected and was lying around in the workshop when later on, some workman who didn't read Hebrew, who didn't know Hebrew at all, mules the two because he knew that this guy was a Jew and he didn't know that this was about Jesus. He just put the two together. Now I realize that's a far fetch, but that's what collectors do all the time when they find things that are interesting and they're unpublished and they would like to imagine that it's more important than it really is. As it stands, it's a Pastorino unknown aftercast. But to me, this is interesting for two reasons. One, that this guy might be a Jew. And two, that Jesus medals, we don't know where they come from, may originate in Ferrara. This was lying around in Ferrara because they were cast in Ferrara. So those are the two hypotheses that I've made up just to be a wise guy. Let me go on because we have a few more minutes. Here's a medal that shows a dove with a message in his mouth going to Noah's Ark. So this is peace returning, you know, peace or, you know, things going back to, to normal. There are many medals of, of Noah's Ark. that represent peace. This one, if you can see it, has the number 100 on what he's carrying in his mouth. So I suppose reasonably that this is a 100th anniversary of some peace treaty. And if I'm a guessing man that this is an 18th century medal, the peace would be of the peace of uh, Ryswick which was in 1648, so this would be 1748. I'm just guessing, I don't really know. But the questions that remain, aside from my guesswork, is what the hell ESP stands for and why the medal was made with a loop. And by the way, where the medal was made, because the Peace of Ryswick involved the Holy Roman Empire, involved the Dutch, involved the Spanish, it involved all kinds of people. And this thing has no indication of where it was made. And even if you assume my guesswork is right about the date and the purpose, the ESP and the location and the reason for the loop are all remaining mysteries. Any thoughts? Okay, it's difficult. Let me move on. Here's another thing that says exactly what it is on it. It says German afternoon hours in Stockholm at the place of I.P. Müller. And it's dated, this is an engraved object in 1834. And there's a motto, or order is half of life. 
Well, it's together. This is a bunch of Germans who were orderly, and this is their motto. And they're all meeting together every once in a while as a fraternal learned group in Stockholm. And they meet at Muller's place. The only problem is that Ulf Nordland, who's many of you know, put this in a uh, Swedish a numismatic newspaper. Nobody ever heard of it. Nobody ever heard of I.P. Muller. Nobody ever heard of the German uh, blah, blah, blah. So it's completely identified as to what it is. And by the way, it was worn, even though it's a privately engraved medal, it was worn by somebody. Um, but nobody actually can go the extra step. And I don't know if anybody can read this Germanic hand because it probably says something that's legible to somebody, but I can't read it. It looks to me like it's in Swedish rather than German, but I can't read it and it's in a handwriting. So that's one thing. Let me, if I can just close with one more thing, um, show you this. This is a well-known medal that was made in the 1530s in Bohemia. It shows Moses and it's struck. It's a struck medal that was later after cast as it turns out. It had die breaks. You see that it's die broken. Look at my pointer over here. You see that letter die break? There's the die break. There's the die break. There's the die break. Okay? There's another die break. Over here, there's no die break between these letters and this line. On later iterations, there is a die break over there, and you can see it developing. There's also a die break where the X, which is Exodus 13, is, you see the die break here. The question is whether this medal on the right, which I own, and which has nothing over here, is before the Exodus 15 was punched in the first place, whether it's a die trial, or whether somehow after this die break, somebody managed to repair the die and make this perfectly smooth. And let me tell you, you can't tell, but I can tell you that this smooth area and this smooth area are at exactly the same level. That is to say that if they repaired the die by grinding it down, it wouldn't be at the same level. So the question is, is this a die trial? Because everything is very sharp, as sharp as this, sharper than many of the other impressions which are worn down. And that's my final question of the day. Can any of you speak to the question of whether this is likely to be a early die trial, an early striking before the die was completed, or is likely to be a repaired die by some technique that I don't know. But it lacks the die break here, and it lacks the die break here, and it's therefore as close as possible to this earliest version rather than to these intermediate versions where the die break is progressing along. What is the metal? The metal, it was made in, as a biblical metal. No, no. What is, materially, what is, what silver. is, it is silver. silver. This one is in white metal, all of the others are silver. And they're all struck. They, it's also can be cast, and I don't want to get into that. These are all struck, they're all the right size. They're all from the same die, by the way. All of the dies are the same die. So that is my final thing. And I would like to sort of bring the session to a close by the obvious remark that these were all toughies. I'm no slouch, you're no slouches. 
what can we say about these unresolved inquiries? Some collectors get their satisfaction from the chill, from the thrill of the chase, or from capturing famous long sought after rarities, or from completing their collection of individual objects, you know, that fit a particular series. <laughs> Prefer to delve deeply into the whys and wherefores, the things were made in the first place. Metals are less constrained than coins in their variety and in their function. And they therefore provide a lot of opportunity for that sort of plunging in. That's the great thing about being a collector. I can collect what I want, you can collect what you want to each his own. And I'd like to thank you for your attention, which has been helpful in many cases and has provided a few clues that I'm going to pursue. Thanks very, very much. Ira, this is Jai. If I can just make one final suggestion regarding sure. the um, German script on that medal you showed from the German Society and I think Stockholm. Uh, I don't think Stefan Heidemann has been on today, but Stefan Heidemann is very good at deciphering that kind of German cursive. I know Martin Heidemann. I'll send it to him. Stefan. Stefan. I know. Yeah, Ira? Yeah. One more comment on the uh, American system. Yes. Something to, that might relate to the American system of prison correct prison reform, which would have been involved, which would have been associated with hydrogens. That I did not see anything at the 1867 uh, exposition or the medical conference that year. But the people who were proposing it were doing work at that time, and it that's was a very a good thought. I agree discussion. with you. Yeah, that's a good thought. I have, of course, typed "système américain" into Google in the French Google, and I didn't come up with that. Right, but just do it in, in English and think I of this it. as American system prison reform, eighteen sixties stuff. That's very up. good. No, no, I I accept. Yeah. Completely, and I accept the hygiene thing, and not I accept it all. I I think that these are very good suggestions, and I stand corrected. I believe me. The reason I I, I label this help is because I have looked forward and have gained a considerable amount of help. And if not, at least you can spend more time, you know, searching for things that lead you nowhere. But it's fun. Oh, it's fun, and I have had fun organizing this and, and hearing your many suggestions. And I look forward to hearing from you over time uh, if you come up with any other suggestions. Look at the chat, Ira. There's lots of suggestions in there. Oh, OK. I didn't have the opportunity to do that. I don't know. If, Emma, can you copy the chat? I don't, I've never done that. I didn't even know if it's possible. You oh. can. Yes. Emma, do that for me. Yes, yeah, since we recorded it, it's going to be all saved. So I could So I'll be it. able to open the chat then? Yes. Good. Ira, this is fascinating. Yes, thank you, Ira. This was a lot of fun. And well, we are I'm as baffled as you are. <laughs> I'm glad that you've all enjoyed it. I, it was a confessional. And uh, although I know some things about some of them, you can see that these are genuine puzzles. These yes. You know, things that I, I'm hiding the meaning. How many more problem pieces do you have in your collection? I have some others, but these were my juiciest <laughs> ones. We could do part two. <laughs> well, I don't think it would be as good as part one, but if I can come up with part two, I'll, I'll consider the matter. Thank you. <laughs> this was very good, Ira. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Really, it was fun for me to do, and I'm glad you had fun too. Yeah, so that's, that's really awesome. great. And um, next week, we'll be having Heidi Wattsweet, who is a numismatic designer. She works on coins and metals, but next week she will be taking us step by step uh, through the production of how she designs metals. Um, so it's going to be another interesting talk, another medallic talk next week. So I hope to see you then. That is Thanks a great again, talk, Ira. by the way. <laughs> What's that? ID's talk is a great talk.
Yeah, Heidi's, Heidi, Heidi's, Heidi's, Heidi's a wonderful person. I, yeah. Many of us know Heidi personally. Yeah. She's just a wonderful speaker and she's a wonderful artist. And that presentation so is going to be just the best. Yeah. It's going to be great. <clears throat> All right, Emma, if right. there's nothing else, I guess it's going to be time to say bye bye to everybody. Yep. Thanks again, Ira. Goodbye, everyone. Bye. Thank you for watching the American Numismatic Society's YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe. And if you like our online resources, publication, and events, you can support the Society by becoming a member. And don't forget to check out our book and eBay stores. The links are below.